Hi friends, welcome to the Share, Invite, Proclaim channel. My name is Judy. I'm in a series of messages about Revelation. Uh, I've never studied it from uh, verse 1 of chapter 1 to the very last verse of the Bible. And so I felt like it was time, and uh, now's the time. Uh, and again, many of these messages are for my grandkids, so that they can see me, so that they can hear my voice, and so that they can hear the Word of God. And here we are, talking about the seven churches in, Gen uh, Genesis, in Revelation chapters 1 to 3. We started at Ephesus, we've gone all the way around, and now we're at the city of Laodicea, Laodicea in Western Turkey. And as I've mentioned before in all of these um, messages, that um, I appreciate my seminary professor, James Blevins, uh, for uh, telling us about ways to interpret Revelation in that it can be as a play. A play in that using the number code and the letter code, all of those things, uh, we can realize how first century Christians could interpret this information without being destroyed by the Roman government because they were being persecuted. And so Ephesus is the only place where there were seven windows for acts and for play for the play. Only one in the uh, region who who had seven. Most of the Greek theaters had three, and so this revelation fits perfectly in this type of setting. And in Act One, we see uh, letters to the seven churches, and. Jesus in the middle, and you have the 24 elders surrounding the throne, and uh, they are typically considered the apostles and the patriarchs. And so uh, when uh, John would be given information about uh, a church, and John is standing over here, um, the menorah would be lit, and uh, then uh, coming out of the window would be uh, a picture of the church. So let's take a look at Laodicea. The background of the church from Revelation 3, 14 to 22. Well, it's, it's in a unique location. Um, it's 12 miles northwest of Colossae, uh, six miles southwest of Heropolis. So if you have Heropolis here, Colossae here, Laodicea here, and the Lucis River runs uh, right north of Laodicea, and you might think, well, why does that make any difference? Well, it does in that in time of siege, um, the water of the Lucis River was not strong enough to support the city of Laodicea. So they had built a uh, stone aqueduct from Heropolis uh, down to Laodicea. And Heropolis had uh, hot springs, about 95 degrees was the water. And so by the time it was piped to Laodicea, it was lukewarm. And so when Jesus later on he talks about them being lukewarm, it resonated with the people that, oh, I know about lukewarm water. Hmm. Well, the city was founded by Antipas II, around 261 BC, and he named it uh, the city after his wife, Laodice, Laodice. It became a Roman province where the, uh, and, and a sissy town where the Roman governor would periodically come to court. Uh, the city was on a fertile plain with good farming. They raised black sheep. Then they would use that wool for a poplar line of clothing and for carpets. And the city became a banking center. It was a very wealthy city, so much so that when the earthquakes came in AD 17 and AD 60, 
like in other cities like Philadelphia and Sardis, the city didn't have to take anything from the Roman government. It was so wealthy, they could rebuild on their own. The city had a school of medicine and produced an eye salve called Colorun, K-O-L-L-Y-R-I-O-N. And next door to the school was a temple of God of healing called Men Karu. And the city had a large Jewish population, about 7,500 descendants of the 2,000 Jews that moved back from Babylon in 213 BC. So that's the background of the city. Let's get into the message. Words of greeting in verse 14. It's a word to the pastor of the church. And words from the Son of Man. Now this, t this uh, title, Son of Man, Mark, the Gospel of Mark, Mark used that a lot to refer to Jesus. And he says, the amen, the amen, the God of truth. It's absolutely true and trustworthy to the faithful and true witness. The beginning, the creation of God. So Jesus was the origin and the source of all created things. Words of praise. They didn't have any. Christ didn't have any for them. The Christians were too compromised. They didn't make waves by evangelism. They had no persecution from the Jews. They stayed under the radar. Words of weakness. This lukewarm nature of the church, as I mentioned before, of the lukewarm water coming from Hierapolis, Hierapolis, and Jesus said that it's neither hot nor cold, and this nauseated him that he wanted to spew or vomit them out of his mouth. Words of warning. The church members were blinded by self-righteousness. They thought they lacked nothing. They were self-sufficient. Now, from Christ's viewpoint, the church members were wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Christ reproves or reprimands or rebukes them and disciplines the church. The cure was to buy from Christ gold refined by fire. You know, the, the dross is burned out. The dross represents sin. It is burned out. They need spiritual riches, the gold. Exchange their white exchange white garments as spiritual clothing instead of the black garments so that their shame and their nakedness would not be revealed. They needed eye salve that was spiritual for their blind eyes. And, and Jesus says, be zealous and repent. That's the cure. Words of reward. Christ stands at the door of your heart. In Philadelphia, it was the open door. Christ stands at the door of your heart and knocks. Christ dines with the believer who opens the door of their heart. He who overcomes, meaning that he who repents, will sit with Christ on his throne. Christ overcame. That means that he, Christ followed God's mission to provide salvation to those who would accept Jesus as the Lord and Savior. Christ overcame and sat down with God, the Father, on his throne. Words of music. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And before I go into a review of the seven churches, right before I was studying about Laodicea, I kept hearing these songs in my mind about uh, songs that I learned Uh Christ told them to open their spiritual eyes. And I was thinking of, open my eyes that I might see. Glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hand that wonderful key. That shall unclasp and set me free. Then the chorus, silently now. I wait for thee, ready my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me, spirit divine. And then the verse goes on to open my ears and open my mouth. And then... I kept hearing in my mind the song, 
uh, I need thee every hour. You know, the Laodiceans didn't think they needed God because they were so wealthy. It goes, I need thee every hour, most precious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee. Oh, I need thee. This is, of course, every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, thy Savior. I come to thee. I need thee every hour. Stay thou nearby. Temptations lose their power when thou art nigh. I need thee every hour in joy or pain. Come quickly and abide a life in vain. And then verse four, I need thee every hour, teach me thy will. Thy promises so rich in me fulfill. And then verse five, I need thee every hour, most holy one. O oh, make me thine indeed, thou blessed son. I need thee, oh, I need thee every hour, I need thee. O oh, bless me now, my savior, I come to thee. And then another one uh, is, uh, near to the heart of God. I, I really kept thinking of this one as well. There is a place of quiet rest, near to the heart of God, a place where sin cannot molest, near to the heart of God. Of course, O oh, Jesus, blessed Redeemer, sent from the heart of God, hold us who wait before thee, near to the heart of God. It's kind of refreshing to me to think of these old hymns they're, they're inspired by the writers who, who saw scripture and God enveloped a song in their heart. Well, let's review these seven churches. Uh, Ephesus, you think of Ephesus as brotherly love and it unified the church in its mission, but love is lost when anything, which in their case was a campaign against uh, heresy, when anything comes before brotherly love. Remember the love of Christ. Repent of your sins that lead you away from brotherly love. Do the good works that God calls you to do. Smyrna, he said, persecution is near. Do not fear. Be faithful unto death. You are rich in God's eyes. And what would that be? Well, that would be peace and love, restored relationships, and eternity with God. And then Pergamum. Compromise with sin is wrong. You are there because you are faithful like Antipas. Do not compromise your faith in Christ. Christ rewards believers with hidden manna, a white stone, and a new name on the stone. And then Thyatira. It was a guild city. It was Jesus or your career. The church tolerated Jezebel and her false teaching. Love, but don't be soft in false teaching. That was the message. And then Sardis, Satan can enter through the back door. If you play church, Satan can enter. Stay on mission to share the gospel. Wake up, be watchful, remember the faith and the gospel. Obey, repent so that your name will not be blotted out the book of life. And then Philadelphia, Jesus has the key to the door of the destination of your eternity. Jesus has the door to the destination of your eternity. Believers receive the key and enter the, God's kingdom. It's used 50 times in Matthew. Unbelievers, Jesus has the key to open the door and throw you into hell and then shut the door for eternity. And then Laodicea, great wealth can blind the eyes of a believer who becomes self-sufficient, self-righteous, believing that they don't need God. Because they're lukewarm, Jesus will vomit them out of his mouth. Open your door to your heart and receive God's spiritual riches, God's spiritual clothing, and God's spiritual sight. Well, it was interesting to learn about these seven churches and, and the message that the Son of Man gave to uh, each church. Um, we're going to start Act 2 or uh, beginning in uh, Revelation chapter 4. So stay tuned, get ready, and let's go.